welcome to New Space Chicago. I'm Dave Burst, I'm the Executive Director of New Space Chicago, and I'm really happy to see so many of you folks out this evening. And I forgot my question, hang on a second. So we are New Space Chicago. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization focused on encouraging the new space industry in Chicago. And you might say, what new space industry? Well, we are it. Um, we are we, we are here to uh, encourage people to build startup companies that are focused on space. Um, and that is um, a challenge. As, as you might think, uh, realize, there's not a whole lot of space industry in Chicago, um, but we have all of the elements that are necessary for uh, a, a thriving space industry here. Um, and so this, this group of people and the people who come to our events um, are interested in making that happen and, and really bringing those elements together and uh, engaging in the exciting things that are happening in the space industry in general and having that happen here in Chicago. Um, before we get started, just a couple of announcements. Uh, first, a shout out to our sponsors. Um, first of all, MHub, which is this wonderful space that we're in. MHub is an incubator for startups focused on manufacturing. And um, we have an amazing space beyond the wall. Uh, if you have an opportunity to take a tour, I highly recommend it. Uh, and uh, we're very grateful for them sponsoring these events here. Um, our second sponsor is Metropolitan Brewing. Uh, they are providing a beer <laughs> that we've been enjoying this evening. Uh, they were one of the first craft breweries in Chicago, and they're about to celebrate their 10th anniversary this month. Uh, so we're, we're very happy about that. Um, New Space Chicago is also very happy to uh, be involved in a partnership with uh, Orbit Use Habitat. Uh, we have brought Habitat to MHub. And so Habitat is uh, a, an opportunity to build more space startup. Uh, and so Orbit Use provides basically three services. One is Habitat, which is a local incubator focused on uh, building space startups. They also provide a service called um, Masters, which provides um, educational content for people who are interested in doing space startups. So they have um, accelerator content, uh, certifications in various topics and so forth. Um, and they also have a fintech platform for crowdfunding space startups. Uh, so it's, it's uh, quite a package to help you get your space startup going. And uh, we brought Habitat here to MHub, so we have a nice partnership there. And if you're interested in creating a space startup, I strongly recommend uh, checking this out. Contact us at uh, Chicago at orbitviews.com or go to the New Space Chicago website and check out um, the, the uh, link there called Habitat. So this evening, uh, we're very pleased to welcome Mark LaPena, who is CEO of Zenesis. And uh, well, Mark will tell you all about Zenesis, but he's been um, Uh, Mark has been uh, involved in space since the age of nine when he attended space camp. <laughs> um, and uh, he worked in the aviation and space industries for a significant part of his career, uh, mostly in understanding how data could be utilized in a variety of applications. Uh, six years ago, he was recruited to digitize and commercialize live aviation data, uh, but discovered that of the 100,000 commercial flights daily, nearly 20% of them went untracked during flight operations. Um, and he's going to tell you more about that story, but that led to Genesis. So without further ado, uh, let me bring Mark up to the stage. Hello. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. Normally I would say, I didn't hear you, but I really can't hear you, so it's okay. I'm a little bit of a head cold. Um, so I started uh, Zenesis four and a half years ago. Um, I've been a Chicago resident for the better part of 30 years. Um, but I grew up in Florida, um, right outside of uh, 
Winter uh, neighborhood, or right outside of Orlando, uh, a city called Winter Park. And I just have always been kind of a space geek. Um, Star Trek, Star Wars, like them both, you know, cheers and cheers on that one. But I um, fell really deeply in love with space when the shuttle program uh, first started uh, back in the 80s. And uh, never missed a shuttle launch, but saw every single one of them. And my career path kind of took me in a little bit of a roundabout way uh, until about four and a half years ago. And as Dave said, my, I spent the early part of my career in aviation and data science, working for three different companies over a course of 25 years. Um, I won't bore you with all those details, but what I will say is um, my last company was sold to ExxonMobil Aviation uh, for a large sum of money and a small piece of the company, and I took a year off. And that's kind of where the story starts. Um, I took a year off. From, uh, the, from life, I knocked a few items off my bucket list and literally saw the entire Caribbean from a suitcase for about 360 some odd days. And I was recruited by Austin Consulting Group um, to work for a company called Official Airline Guide. Now, has anybody here heard of Official Airline Guide? Okay, good, a few of you. So, Official Airline Guide has been around for about 80 years. Uh, they are the senior data purveyor of the aviation industry. Without boring you too much, they have been printing a bullet called the Official Airline Guide for the better part of 50 plus years. Um, and I remember it because my dad used to use it, and I could always find where my dad was because he traveled a lot by looking at the Official Airline Guide because he'd leave one at home and he'd take one with him and he'd highlight wherever he was. So every day I'd get up and I'd try to figure out like, you know, where in the world is my dad. And that's what told me where he was. So I was really excited to go work for Official Airline Guide. So I gleefully accepted the job sitting on the beach in Aruba and um, moved back to Chicago and started working for Official Airline Guide. And about three months into my job, which was basically to take this print media company and help them to digitize their entire data set into analytical products and data feeds that over 900 airlines and over 4,000 airports globally were consistently purchasing. And so I went in and set them up. And about four months into my gig there, I realized that they had this massive hole in their data set. So there's about 100,000 commercial flights on a daily basis, and about 20,000 of them, which I couldn't believe when I figured this out, go untracked during the course of their flight. Now, can anybody answer why that is? Why do 20,000 airlines or commercial flights go off the radar screen during their duration? Rich? Yes. Ding, ding, ding. Curvature of the Earth. Two thirds of the Earth is covered by water. And they only track aviation assets from the ground currently. So I spent some time, some of my own money, about six months and about 50 grand, trying to figure out how to solve this problem. And interestingly enough, I met that guy sitting over there. His name is Rich Godwin. He spoke last month. And Rich Godwin was, uh, was there kind of at, the, um, at a pivotal moment uh, because I had planned on helping airlines and airports track aviation assets by mounting hardware on the ground at airports around the world, which is really close to what they were already doing. Rich said, well, why don't you, why don't you use small sense? <laughs> Oops. So I started to look into it and did a ton of research. And um, I resigned from my company on uh, August 31st, uh, 2014. After pitching my company, Official Airline Guide, on launching a mega constellation of satellites tracking aircraft from space using automated dependent surveillance broadcasts. And I, you know, put together a bunch of pre-sales. I have $10 million of pre-sales from you know, existing customers that were willing to pay for this hyper-accurate location-based data. And uh, partnered with Gong Space and building out the satellite. And it just done a tremendous amount of work over a very short period of time. And so I flew to Luton, United Kingdom, which is where Official Airline Guide was located at the time. And I met with the executive leadership team and I pitched them on this amazing business concept and it would have solidified Official Airline Guide's position in the marketplace for the foreseeable future. And the CEO leaned back in his chair and said, that idea is bollocks, which is British for thanks but no thanks. So I, uh, I asked for work product release and I got it, which I was surprised. And I resigned the next day, and on November 1st, 2014, I started on off-block. 
And on Upblock, as I've explained, the sole mission of that company was to aggregate live, hyper-accurate flight traffic data. And by the time I started the company, we were actually closing in at about $30 million in services pre-sales and in, in subscription-based revenue, which is a lot. I've gone over most of this. Um, to, to, to make up for my lack of understanding, my lack of expertise in satellite design and concept of operations and orbital mechanics and physics and all the things you need, you need to know to launch a satellite, I partnered with Georgia Tech Small Satellite Design Lab. And a gentleman at the Small Satellite Design Lab, a guy by the name of Bobby Brown, was the director of the SS deal at the time. And prior to that, he was the chief technology officer of NASA. So, you know, pretty good credits. Um, and it's interesting because about, about two and a half years into the business, you know, fast forward to 2016, about November, um, I realized we, you know, we, we had a major problem. I'm going to go back to the other slide in a second. I realized we had a major problem. Um, we had gone through the satellite design, we had gone through the orbital mechanics, we, we thought we had it all figured out. You know, we had a potential couple potential investors. We needed to raise about $45 million to make this whole thing happen. And um, we got to the downlink portion of our business concept, of our concept of operations. Um, you know, we were, we were modeling and aggregating over four and a half petabytes of data every single day. Over the course of about 16 hours which is a lot. It's more data than Google aggregated in the first year of its entire existence. And we were going to create that data every day, but more importantly, that data was live, mission-critical, hyper-accurate flight data. And the only way to monetize that data is to set the last hop. So take it from the, from the aircraft main bus, and then collect it, aggregate it, structure it, and then feed it right back up into the cockpit. We had to do that in under 200 milliseconds, which is about as fast as Google search. We found out, and this was kind of a big oops, but you know, this is a startup, it's a startup story, right? We found out that the cost to downlink that data and put it back in the cockpit was over $100 million a year. And to put it in perspective, the total accessible market that we were pursuing was 250 million. So that was, uh, you know, kind of a big problem to have. You know, we were chasing 75 million and a combined annual growth rate of 7.25%. Suddenly all these investors that we had that were interested were like, yeah, we gotta go, but thanks. So that's when we said, Houston, we have a problem. So what did we do? I mean, we had a couple choices. Could fold up shop and go out and get a JOB. No thanks. We could try to sell our idea to somebody that wasn't as smart as we finally were, and that's really kind of unethical, so that was not a good idea. And we had some interested parties in our, our concept of operations. Um, or we could try to figure out if there was anything in the business that was salvageable. So guess what I did? I met with Rich again. I met with Rich and uh, one of a couple of his friends at Butterfield's restaurants, breakfast place in Naperville. And, um, and it was a Thursday, as I remember. And uh, I brought my business plan, and I had all these great ideas, I thought we could figure out what the problem, how to solve the problem, and I met with Rich, I met with a couple of his guys, and they proceeded to just basically tear me up one side, clear across the top and down the other. And I didn't get to eat a single bite of my breakfast. That sucked, because it's good food. And at the end of the meeting, you know, Rich and his partner looked at me and they said, listen, you know, Mark, it's not the end of the world. You know, you, you've experienced the same problem every satellite manufacturer or operator has ever experienced. It's nothing new. And the problem is, is how do we get massive amounts of data from space down to the ground, structure it, clean it, and deliver it to a point of consumption in ultra low latency for low cost? And Rich looked at me and he said, Mark, if you can solve this problem, you can create a whole completely new industry. And it was Thursday, and I had a meeting scheduled with my attorney for the next day, for Friday, to dissolve my company, quite literally. 
Um, so we were literally a day away from you know, bankrupting the company. <laughs> and, uh, so I, 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 you know, I, I walked out of the meeting, you know, fortunately Rich paid for lunch or breakfast, thanks. And then, um, I got in my car and I called my attorney and I said, hey, listen, can you do me a favor? Can we reschedule to Monday? And I said to myself, sitting in the car, and I had like some beat up, broken down, like Audi A6, like a million miles on it. And I was sitting there and it's like, it's, it's cold out, you know, the car is cold starting and I hadn't eaten yet. And I watched everybody else eat and I just had my business handed to me on a silver platter after its head got cut off. And I literally was like teary-eyed. I was like, oh my God, what the frick am I gonna do? And I said, you know, I'm gonna give myself three days. And if I can't solve this problem in three days, I'll never be able to solve it. So I went home, had a couple scotches. It was afternoon, don't worry. And um, I just started to kind of dive into the problem. And I started to kind of, you know, take from, you know, take away from meeting what Richard told me was just keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple. Stop trying to solve all the world's problems and just try to solve one tiny little problem. And if you can solve one tiny little problem, then you can solve more tiny little problems, and you can create an aggregated effect and gain momentum. And yeah, I know it sounds really kind of cheesy saying that now, but that's exactly what I did. Went home, got a couple scotches, and started to attack the problem. And I started to try to realize, you know, what my resources were. And the resources I had were people. Um, the biggest resource you'll ever have starting a company is not your money. Not your technology. Um, it's not anything short of people. It takes people to start a company. It takes people to build a company from an idea to something that's tangible. So I called Bobby Braun, the guy at SSD and SSDL at Georgia Tech, and I had him on my speed dial on my cell phone. And I actually hadn't even, you know, gotten home when I called him. I called him right after breakfast on my way home and I said, Bobby, it's Mark. He's like, oh God, what? Because you know, I've been talking to Bobby for the better part of two and a half years, and we had no research with him yet. He was totally helping me on the cuff. And I said, Bobby, I've got this problem. And he's like, oh, God, what, what happened? And I said, well, you know, we have four and a half petabytes of data that we have to download from space every day, and we have to do it for, you know, less than $100 million a year. And when he was done laughing, he said, well, it's interesting. I, I might have an idea. And of course, to a guy, or gal at this point, to a, to a guy or gal that just spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of their own money, just watched three guys wolf down breakfast and tear your business apart, just basically felt like I lost everything. When someone says they have an idea or they have a solution, you, you just, you're on the edge of your seat. Anybody else ever been in a situation like that? Yes, you know. So, you know, I'm on the edge of my seat and I'm driving. Not a good place to be. And he says, I got this new technology. Well, it's not new, but it's a newer kind of technology. But they're working on a jet propulsion lab. He said, you should give these guys a call. So he introduced me to a couple of people at Jet Propulsion Lab. And I literally called them before I had not gotten home yet. And so I called up a gentleman by the name of Mark Homer, who was the director of licensing and technology for the Office of Technology Transfer at NASA. And his office happened to be at Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena, California. So I called him up and I was like, hey Mark, Bobby Braun told me to call you. And he's like, yeah, I just got an email from him. He said, you know, I should probably set aside a little bit of time. I said, I said listen, I'll make it quick. Can you tell me a little bit about the technology you have? He said, sure. We have a uh, 10 gigabit per second laser transceiver that is you know, modeled after a successful NASA mission and it transmits data 10 gigs per second. It uses laser beams and it's a you know, it's, it's, it's something we're looking to license. And I said, how big is it? And I'm thinking it's like the size of a, you know, a, a Volkswagen. And he's like, well, it's pretty big. He said, it's about the size of a tissue box. <laughs> and, and, it, and it uses 160 watts. And, you know, by this point, I actually understood, you know, a little bit about satellite, you know, speak. I could understand constant of operations. I could understand... You know, swap. I understood a lot of different things prior to the prior two years of education I got in space. And uh, and everything he's saying, I'm sitting there I'm like, I'm, I'm getting fixed. I mean, I'm sitting at a red light. The red light had actually turned green and went through two cycles. I just totally lost track of where I was. And people behind me were honking their horn, and finally somebody came up to the window, was knocking on my window. I'm like, dude, go, you know. And I was just so enthralled in this conversation because the technology he was telling me about solved all my problems. 
So by the time the tab was paid at lunch, I was in tears. And I was crying tears of joy sitting at a traffic light. Some total stranger pounding on my window saying, hey, dude, go to the light screen like two times already. And somebody from Jeff Repulsion Line, who I'd never met, was telling me that they had a solution that solved our problem. Moral of the story is, you know, cry if you're going to cry, but, you know, don't do it in public, maybe. Don't do it in a traffic light. So, you know, here we are right around November, and uh, two years after I started the company. And so I took the rest of the weekend and I looked at the technology. And I contacted other guys at Domspace and asked them if that, you know, if this technology be integrated into our satellite bus. And at the end of the day, the answer was all yes. It solved our problem. There was a tremendous amount of work to be done past that, but it solved our problem. And it allowed us to save 1% of our company, like I said before. So, Zenesis was born. It's Zenesis. I don't really care what you call us as long as you call us. So, you know, what does this all mean? You know, I'm going to kind of get into the meat and potatoes of Zenesis now. This is really where the startup story be, it kind of gets its traction. You know, communications over the better part of 50 years have been done using radio frequency. And who here understands radio frequency? Okay, well, for those of you that didn't raise your hand, make it quick. When I was a kid, Dad drove me around in a beat up old Toyota, and all we had was an AM radio. And in an AM radio, you got two dials one's a power, one's the spectrum, and one's the frequency. And you can only put so much, you've got to turn the dial so much down, you can only turn it so much up. That is a great explanation for how spectrum works. Spectrum is limited by physics. There's only so much of it. But over the last 50 years, we've launched thousands of satellites. Currently, there's about 1,800 on orbit. And with 1,800 satellites in orbit, they're already provisioning spectrum. People are, companies are fighting over it. They spend millions of dollars a year in attorney's fees and lobbyists with the International Telecommunications Union trying to license that spectrum. And only the rich get it. If you're a small company, good luck. You have a really, really small chance of getting spectrum nowadays. The main reason for that isn't just because there's 1,800 satellites in orbit. It's because there's over 20,000 planned by 2026, 2027. So it's a market increase. Not a order magnitude increase, but certainly close to the number of satellites that are being planned. So what does that mean? What it means is it's creating a bottleneck. We need a communications revolution. And the revolution starts with stepping outside of the box, stepping outside of what we know to be a norm, which is spectrum communications, and looking at new technology. And it's really not new, which is the best part. Optical communication has been around for over 50 years. But optical communications can send data, not faster. You know, they all operate at the speed of light. But they can send more data. Now, why is that? Anybody know? It's not binary. Well, yes, but Rich? Exactly. So Rich said very short wavelengths. Um, what that really means is, you know, if you if you look at a spectrum, you know, the wavelengths are kind of like this, they kind of loop along. And with every peak and every valley, they can cram data into it, right? But with light, laser beams, it kind of goes like this, right? So the beams are more narrow, they're more condensed, they have the ability to hold more data. So our capacity is significantly higher. But the best part about optical communications is they're unlimited. You know, with spectrum, when you get to the end of the dial, you can't just add another station. With laser-based communications, with optical communications, we operate in a 15-50 nanometer wavelength, which is near infrared, but it's outside the visible spectrum. And if we run out of capacity on one satellite, we can launch another satellite and increase the capacity by launching another satellite. Most spectrum operators can't do that. So what does that really mean? We offer you know, a 10 to 50x increase in the amount of data we can send. It's also cheaper to manufacture. An optical satellite, I know a little bit about this because we're doing this now. 
an optical satellite, we can launch, we can build and launch an optical satellite for $5 million. With the same capacity that a $50 to $100 million satellite costs. I can prove that. That's, that's just math. So at the end of the day, you know, I, I wanted to show you guys what would be what I call a trade, uh, a trade explanation. So there's um, several different bands you can operate in if you're communicating data from space. And I won't bore you with too many details and go down every single one of these line items. But what I will say is there's KA band, we're going to talk about X band and optical. The bottom line on a KA band transmission at 10 gigs a second, the total cost is $100 a minute. So in the course of a day, if you want a fierce satellite operator, if you're operating in LEO, you're going to get probably 64 minutes a day in downlink, in downlink time, total pass environment, or a pass environment. What that means is as the satellite's falling around the Earth in its orbital, in its orbital path, in its inclination, it's going to, on average, see a ground tracking station for a total combined time of about 64 minutes a day. And it's going to be able to transmit that data at 2 gigabits a second. With optical, I'm sorry, with X-Band, the time per day is about the same. You still have about 64 minutes, but the capacity is significantly less. It averages about 200 megabits a second. This is for smaller, you know, LEO-based satellites. And the cost of that is about $17.50 a day. And if you use the exact same configuration with optical, we don't have the limitation on pass because we actually can relay our data up through space and down to any, any one of 100 stations of the network that we're building. So we get a total of 40 minutes a day. It's basically a dedicated pipeline. You, and you don't pay per minute but I wanted to show you, if you did pay per minute, what the, what the trade would be or what the comparison would be. It's about $1.20. But the real kicker is, that's at 10 gigs a second versus 2 gigs a second. So we have this massive price advantage. We have this massive capacity advantage. And so the question is, why aren't people just, you know, why isn't there a line on the door chasing me to sign up for satellite communications? because we have to prove it works. So the technology that we licensed from Jeff Propulsion Lab is pictured here. This is our prototype. This is being developed in partnership with Jeff Propulsion Lab, NASA, Georgia Tech, my company. And what you see here is, unfortunately it's not actually this big, um, it's about, oops, it's about that big. So this optical head right here, this is where the laser, laser beam comes out of. The laser source is in the back. We use a flat surface cavity emitting laser, emitting laser source. Um, very low wattage. Uh, it's a four channel multiplex beam. And I know all this is kind of techno speak, but at the end of the day, it uses four different types of light, four different colors of light. Binds them into one light source. and shoots them out of this 10 centimeter aperture. Now, what you see here, is actually a prototype that has actually worked, and we've tested it for over 30,000 feet. Uh, back in 2014, before we inherited it, it was attached to the underside of a Cessna 187, which is a Cessna aircraft. It's a private little, you know, four-seat aircraft, and it was flown over Table Mountain, which is where Jet Propulsion Lab is located, and it was uh, tested for four hours in a very unstable environment. You know, Cessna aircraft, they tend to bounce around a little bit. It's not like a commercial flight. A little gust of wind can send the aircraft about six or seven feet, you know, laterally. And in, you know, Southern California, it doesn't rain, but it's pretty windy. And during the course of that four-hour test, it maintained a 99.9% wind .9 budget, which is unheard of. It's massive, it's insane. To a, someone that understands more about what we do than even I do, they're pretty amazed by that. So what we have to do now is we have to test it from space. So we've partnered with not only Georgia Tech, we've also partnered with Nanorax, and we're also talking to Airbus and the Bartolomeo platform. We intend on attaching our prototype to the International Space Station in late, this, late uh, November, December this year. We will conduct a three-month demonstration, and during that demonstration, I'll get to these numbers in a second, during that demonstration, 
we will um, demonstrate not only direct link capacity capability, but also relay capacity. One of our partner companies is launching a um, concept of operations uh, Pathfinder mission with a 100 gig interlink operable head. And so we will relay through that satellite in Neo during our test uh, late this year, early next year. But what does it all mean? You know, technology is cool, right? But there needs to be a happy ending to the story. So I'm trying to give you one. So remember when we were looking at this chart earlier, we were looking at a $250 million marketplace. The space communications industry is a $78 billion market. A lot more money there, a lot more opportunity. And we're chasing $70 billion of it. And as we look forward towards the future, we've got over $15 million of hardware pre-sales right now. My company is Nisus. We haven't manufactured a single piece of product yet, haven't tested it in space. But when we, we, we license this technology, and you know, I learned a really valuable lesson the first time around. I learned that it's really cool to have cool technology, it's really cool to have a great idea, but if people aren't willing to pay for it, it's worthless. It's just a good idea, and good luck with it. So the first thing we did, we inherited this technology, is we found out that the market was willing to pay for it, and if they were willing to pay for it. And the market resounded, and we said, yes, we're willing to pay for it, and we're willing to pay a shitload for it. And the shitload is over $15 million in hardware pre-sales, with only two customers. We've only started trying to pre-sell about nine months ago, actively. When we got the license, we announced it with a press release. We have I mean, 50 or 60 companies asking to think of buy the hardware. And they didn't want to just buy the hardware, they wanted to buy the license, they wanted to buy the whole thing. And we said, mm, yeah, no, and no, and no. But we'll license it to you. So the first part of our business was hardware pre sales. But we also wanted to make sure that we didn't position ourselves as strictly a hardware play. Because, you know, I spent some time in Silicon Valley and uh, I've watched the show, and the show actually isn't that inaccurate. Um, the Valley is um, not really keen on investing in hardware, especially hardware startups. So I had to find a way to switch from being a hardware company to being a services company. So we started partnering with companies, much like Dave's doing with his business. Uh, we started partnering with companies like Atlas Space Operations, and Laser Light Communications, and you know, L3 Harris, and All Aerospace, and Jabel Manufacturing, and a whole host of other companies, including, you know, Jeff Propulsion Lab and Asset, Rich Tech. Um, some really awesome partnerships we developed. And through those partnerships, we've actually been able to put ourselves in a situation where we can now charge customers, potential customers, service fees for future-based communications because of the partnerships we develop. One of our partner companies is a company called Laser Lake Communications, and they're launching a 12 satellite constellation in NEO. It's already paid for, got a billion dollars in funding from Rothschild Bank and an export credit facility. It's already pretty much done. They've already contracted with Boeing to build 20 satellites, and those satellites are about the size of Volkswagen bus. They have the ability to interlink at 100 gigs and up and down at 100 gigs. And in partnership with those, with that partnership, we also created another partnership with a company called Atlas Space Operations. And Atlas Space Operations is building over 110 ground nodes, all capable of optical, all directly connected to wide gauge fiber. So last mile's figure that as well. And we are, Zenesis, my company, is the exclusive hardware provider to both of those companies. So essentially what we've done is we put ourselves in a situation of being the Cisco space, but also being kind of like Comcast or Xfinity. Because ultimately what we intend on doing is giving our hardware in a set-top box configuration. And that's actually one of the first things that said this in public. So the revenue opportunities are really cool. We have the ability to have subscription-based revenue. Initially, that's some hardware-based revenue. But more importantly, what's the average life expectancy of a LEGO satellite? Anybody know? <laughs> Sometimes, yeah. But it's average about five years. And a, and a, Really, the average about three years, but you know, for being kind, it's about five years. Um, mainly because most LEO based satellites don't have um, propulsion on board. So they don't have the ability to maintain orbit, uh, orbital integrity. So they, you know, orbitally decelerate, fall into the Earth's atmosphere, burn up, and the satellite operator, the constellation operator, has to refresh that satellite or that entire constellation. 
So in talking to companies um, uh, like BSO Networks, AMP, uh, Telstra Global, GE, GE is actually a pretty cool story. Um, we've talked to Planet Lab, Mass Robotic. We're actually the right now we're our optical head is the um, contracted optical payload for three lunar missions. Pretty much every lunar mission that's going right now, other than the Chinese, because we can sell it to the Chinese right now. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe ever. Yeah. <laughs> but the, you know, the, the cool story with GE, and, and I won't. Is everybody everybody okay on time? Everybody okay? Cool. Not putting anybody to sleep. Everybody's still looking like you're awake. All right. Cool. So um, the story with GE is really cool. Um, I, I'm a voracious um, geek reader. I like to read, and I don't like to read like Harry Potter and stuff like that. I'll be at school. I like to read financial reports of companies. And, and call me sadist, I literally will fill the bathtub and grab a stack of 10 days and read 10 days and you know, listen to cool music and <laughs> drink scotch. And believe it or not, that stupid, crazy, you know, dumb tactic has paid off. Because I was able to discover in reading the last eight years of GE's 10Ks, not only are they ethically failing as a company, but they're paying exorbitant fees for data transport. Pay $15 billion a year on average just to move data. That's the equivalent of Dave, you're getting a $15 billion Comcast bill. Your data. Now, $15 billion is a lot of money. Not to GE, it's like $127 billion in revenue. So, you know, a couple percent. You know, not a lot. But it's still $15 billion. And it's funny because. It's their prime, their prime for the taking right now. I've started laying out lately, they've been selling off billion dollar revenue generating, you know, subsidiaries, spinoffs. So I contacted GE Healthcare here in Chicago. I had a meeting, yeah. And I got a meeting with their uh, CFO, their global CFO. And a meeting with their global CFO was basically able to say, I like we sat down and their CFO at the time was an interim CFO, it was a young lady, and, and, I, and she said, well, you know, why are we meeting? And I said, well, listen, I, I know you're busy and I'll, I'll make it really quick. I said, from the time I shook your hand to the time that I sat down, I figured out a way to save your company $5 billion in data transport costs. You know, you say a number like that's a CFO, even if they're a $200 trillion company, $5 billion is a lot of money. And she said, well, how do you intend on doing that? And I explained it to her. She actually gave me about 15, 15 to maybe 16 minutes to explain everything. And by the time I was done, she said, great, so when can we, you know, when can we, become, when can we become a customer to do this? Assuming our technology department and everybody, all the other stakeholders would buy in. And I said, well, not until 2021. And she said, why are you meeting with me now? And I said, well, because I wanted to see if you were willing to listen. You know? And again, it's back to that whole thing that we call, in our company, we call it MIT. It's not Massachusetts Institute of Technology. It's the most important thing. My team. Most important thing. Does anybody know what the most important thing in a company is? Raise your hand. You're going to go out and live on this one. There's only one right answer on this one. Rich, you can't. Go ahead. Internally, you're right. But the most important thing to a company is revenue. Not revenue, you got nothing. Not revenue, you can't pay people. You know, there's a lot of founders, a lot of really smart CEOs that would disagree with me. I don't care. Revenue is the most important thing. And that's why I was meeting with the CEO of GE, or the CFO of GE. I knew I couldn't give them anything, and I knew I couldn't give them a contract. I just wanted to see if they'd listen. They did. They saddled it, and they still call. How are things going? So now I have a quarterly update call with GE. It's just a cool story. What does all that mean, though? And I'll get to this in a second. What does all that mean? You know, this is supposed to be a startup story. So here's the here's here's the here's the lesson. The lesson is do what makes you uncomfortable. I don't care what it is. I uh, see. I love people, and I love doing this, and I love selling. There's actually not a lot about my business that I don't love. I don't like accounting. I really hate that. We have a CFO for that, so I don't have to do that. But um, you have to get into the weeds. You gotta be willing to do the dirty work. You gotta be willing to roll up your sleeve. 
you gotta worry, not worry about what you're wearing, you know, sport coat, nice shoes, and driving a nice car, and doing all those really cool things that seems like what startup, startup life is, because it's not like that. I'm 45 years old, I don't have barely a pot to piss in, okay, I've got a really kick-ass company, and we're getting ready to make it, but I'm couch surfing still, and I'm not ashamed to say it. My ego used to my ego used to be so big that I would, you know, John, I've known you for 10 years. You can, you can attest to this. I used to be the slickest guy in the room. I dressed so nice. I, you know, I had the nicest shoes, the nicest watch, the nicest shirt. I mean, you know, if it was new, it, I had it. It was, it was, I was that guy. But what I've learned through this process is none of that stuff matters. What matters is if you have an idea, if you have an idea, if you can get one other person to believe in your idea. That's half the battle. It's half the battle. Just one other person. Because if two of you can get two other people to believe in that idea, there's four, right? And it's exponential. Since we started this company, you know, it was just me. Literally, it was just me. And I begged Rich to come work with me. I, I did. I, you know, I don't know if you remember, but I did. And, 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 I, and, and Rich knew what I didn't know. I wasn't ready. Now we're ready. This week, we got a term sheet for uh, $10 million uh, for, uh, for a network credit facility, so we don't have to give away any equity in the company. We've got a license agreement offer uh, from the original investor, Waze, uh, for $2.5 million. No equity. They just wanted the right to sell the hardware to a uh, specific region. And, um, and we're getting ready to turn down a Series A offer from a couple very, very large venture capitals that are going to have a really bad week next week. Because we've been working on that deal a long time. And we're doing that because, you know, what we built here is an alliance between three companies. And the other companies are fully funded. We're not. We're now finally getting ready to get funded. So it's interesting. What you guys are seeing is you guys are seeing me after four and a half years of the story I just told you, literally days away from signing our funding agreement, which will, we only need five and a half million dollars to get the revenue, and we're getting about 12 and a half. So we have so much dry powder left that we're going to go to a massive hiring spree. And I'm not saying we're going to go on a hiring spree just because we can. I mean, we need a lot of people. We've got a lot of people in, in, in the pipeline. But we're going to relocate the company to Florida. I hate to say it. It's not a big space community here. But more importantly, there's a huge space community in Cape Town. Probably keep an office here in Chicago. I've lived here 30 years. And I plan on you know, living here several months out of the year. But the Power Space Alliance, we announced it at small set just this past year. What the Empower Space Alliance does is it levels the playing field for every single space operator out there. If you want to launch a satellite, do you want to build a satellite? If you want to take pictures of the Earth or you know, sense methane emissions from anywhere in the USA from space, and you want to get that data down on the ground, there's not a single company you can use that's cheaper than us that understands what you're trying to do better than us. Um, or that we'll partner with you, like we will. I mean, Dave, I've been talking to you for what now, about four months, something like that. And we've made at least some kind of an impact. Okay. Maybe not your overall business, but the introductions and the way in which we do business. Um, so, you know, over the next uh, 18 to 36 months, these are the companies that we're partnering with. We've got Propulsion Lab, NASA, Jable, People's are Manufacturing Partner. They built the first iPhone, they built the first Amazon Alexa. They're a huge, fabulous manufacturing company out of Tallahassee, Florida. A few billion dollars in revenue. And they've, uh, we're signing a 15-year deal with them to build our hardware over the next uh, well, 15 years. Kanamatsu, U.S., uh, they're going to be our partner in Asia Pacific. And China didn't get a partnership agreement with us. And several other Earth observation companies. Competition, I suppose I can spend some time going over this, but if anybody wants to know about this, you can just come up and ask me later. Another milestones. Yeah, you know, I developed this milestone chart, I don't know, like a year ago. We've hit every single one of them. Fit every single milestone. And, and there, there's actually a much more detailed milestone chart than this. I didn't want to bore the living Jesus out of everybody, which, I don't know, looks like a pin there. But uh, yeah, in Q1 2018, we negotiated our agreement. We had 40 units pre sold. Uh, research agreement was completed, started raising funds, we had our 75 units pre-sold, we started prototyping, Q4 of this just this past year, we delivered our first brass board, which I showed you a picture of. Uh, I did our first lab test, we're actually a little bit ahead of the curve right now, 
So um, we'll have our testing and certifying done before the end of February. And we were really pushing for Q1 on that um, because we can't test it. We can't test and certify it. Delivered to Nanorax for final installation to a um, Falcon, uh, Falcon 9 rocket in late November, early December, provided everything goes well and we don't get too much backup from the government shutdown. Um, we'll, we should be able to continue to hit our marks. Uh, our team, uh, it's much bigger than this, but um, here's me. My uh, co founder is Bob Eigenpower, ex Um I call him the Mark Whisperer. Um, as you can tell, I'm a little bit out there. He's very well rounded and very even keeled. Dennis Polis, our CTO, um, ex Lockheed, Northrop Grumman guy, DARPA guy, uh, in his early 60s, and understands optics like nobody's business. And Jeff Latstein and Neil Campion, they're one two punch out of Atlanta, Georgia, that I was introduced to a few years ago. And brought them aboard as president and global director of executive, or global director of business development. Um, since bringing Neil aboard uh, as vice president of corporate development and business development, uh, he's brought aboard over $100 million in uh, services and free sales, which I wanted to kind of say at the last, because that's the real big kicker. Uh, through our partnership with Glacier Lake Communications, and at the space operations, we've actually procured over $100 million in services and resales. And that's pretty huge. Uh, all from crying at a stoplight in my car and not taking no for an answer. Uh, not being afraid to tell people who you really are. Not afraid to be yourself. And realizing that, you know, when you screw up, it's okay. You're going to do it again. As long as you don't make the same mistake twice, you'll probably be okay. But um, that's it. You know, our, oh, our board, forgot our board. Human, let's get the trouble with that. Uh, Bart Plant, I don't know, does anybody in here know who Bart Plant is? Nobody? Oh my gosh, it's like a space industry a celebrity. Are you kidding me? Okay, do some research. Bart Plant, uh, lover to death, uh, our second board member, actually. Uh, one of our first uh, outside investors, like, she gave us 25 grand when, like, we would have been asking for it. And um, she founded a company called Boreal Space, I'll make it quick. Um, she was the first person in the world to prove that you can use um, photons from the sun to move a satellite in space. She launched a program called LightSail. You might have heard of it. She's launching LightSail 2 this year. Um, she's become a very, very good friend uh, and a great advisor. I call her the Mark Whisperer 2. Um, boy, I've really formed a great relationship with her, love her to death. Um, she's our, she was our, one of our first board members. Um, Kent Buchanan, uh, ex-CTO of uh, Hearst Corporation, which you guys have heard of them at least. Uh, ex-CTO, has been on our board for a little over a year now. And Sean McDaniel, CEO of Atlas, one of our advisory board members. Uh, Bob Lancaster, Bird Fotheringham. Bird Fotheringham has been around in the satellite communications industry for the better part of 45 years. Again, another celebrity. And just this past week, which I haven't been able to add in the slide yet, um, we just brought aboard uh, Jim Geats, who is the former CEO of Blockbuster and 7-Eleven, to our advisory board. He's also going to uh, come aboard as our president, replacing Jeff Latsky, who's going to come back down to Global Director Strategy. So now we have a Fortune 500 CEO as one of our team members. Um, I've been working with Jim for a couple of years now, trying to recruit him. Finally got him literally like two days ago. So that's, again, new information. So, you know, I guess, um, Appreciate you listening. Um, I'll leave you with this. Uh, I don't care how bad you think your idea is. Try it. Just try it. Because I thought my idea was really good to track aviation assets from space, and the market thought it was a really bad idea. But it showed me another way. And so if you don't, you know, if you don't take that first step, you'll never get to your pivot, and you'll never get to the, you know, the end goal. Whatever that may be for you. And for me, it was a it's totally changed. I gave a TED talk just this past uh, past month on what this really, what the impact of all this is, and the impact of this is we're going to finally have a way to connect with each other. We're going to have a billion people in the world that don't have connectivity, and I know exactly how to do it. So that's, I guess, what the real mission all all of this was. So try it. I don't care how small the idea is, or how big the idea is, or how crazy you think it is. If everybody in the world tells you it's stupid, do it anyway. Just try it. Thanks. Sure.
of shoot. So first question. Here. Check, check. So I very good. Okay. We're going on to the communications. How does environmental? Obviously, cloud cover, you're still sitting in the infrared, you're going to be bringing a filter in for yeah. how many ground stations are you talking about? Because you're talking about two and a half to three second window. Yeah. Every, every two degrees, 15 degrees. Yeah, so great question. Um, it seems like one of the first questions an investor asks is, uh, well, how do you get through clouds? What happens um, with humidity? What happens with, you know, atmospheric interference? I guess I'll scan it. I can't hear it. Yeah, excuse me, I'm just getting over a cold. So atmospheric interference, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, yeah, we're, we're not using directed energy. Um, if we were using directed energy, we could just burn through a cloud. But of course, we could also burn through the atmospheric, atmospheric ground and probably kill some people, which is not a good thing unless you're in the military. So how do we do it? How do we get around it? Um, spatial diversity in the ground is the first way. So we're building over 100 ground nodes that um, each have a, an undisclosed aperture size receding and um, the entire system is patented so uh, the entire system is actually run by over 50 live weather feeds and over 100 years of historical data so we're able to predict within about 92 percent accuracy right now um, as the system matures and, and, and is used we'll increase that but right now we can in our modeling uh, we've done over a thousand simulations um, each simulation is run for an hour so 24,000 hours or what, 10,000 hours? I don't, I don't know now. <laughs> Whatever. Um, we've done so many simulations that we know with a 92 to 95% accuracy what our link budgets will be at any given point in time um, based on, again, historical and live weather fits. So the last way we do that is instead of going in a direct connect environment from a LEO satellite to a receiving station, we send that data up to a MEO satellite and then relay it around to whatever, situ whatever satellite has the best connection. And again, the whole system is administered through the weather. So every single ground station has a live weather system on it. Also, the live 50 live weather feeds, and the whole system is run through the AWS Cloud. Answer your question? Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so my question is a strategic question. As a startup, I'm thinking about the industry you're getting involved in that has you know, massive uh, potential. Um, how are you guys viewing or considering the, um, the incumbents that exist in uh, satellite communication, uh, like KSAT, for example? Like they have a lot of ground stations, they can potentially see that you're going to encroach on their market. So, how are you guys considering that process uh, and those potentials? No, great, great question. Okay. Excuse me, sorry. It's really rude. Um, so, the question was um, you know, how do we take care of incumbents trying to. Well, here, perfect question, right? Um, so, KSAT, I sat the board uh, on a, sorry, an advisory no, on a panel with Catherine from KSAT and uh, the founder of RBC Signals, and uh, um, uh, Bruce Pittman from uh, Nazgan Research um, a couple months ago, our law firm in, in, uh, in uh, Menlo, or Menlo Park, or Palo Alto, sorry. And it's funny because both, both of them, K KSAT and, and RBC Signals, are both you know, saying, oh, we're going to do optical, we're doing optical, we're doing optical. I'm sitting there thinking, like, great, that's cool. Thanks for the validation. So, I mean, I look at it this way. Um, nobody takes a startup seriously until they're successful. And that's kind of the way the market's treating us right now. I mean, the people that, are, that have taken the time to do due diligence on our hardware and our technology realize that we are for real, we're not going anywhere but up, unintended. But, um, you know, listen. Uh, there's there's bridge chat, there's Kinetic, there's you know there's KSAT, there's RBC signals. Everybody is going to eventually be launching an optical head. Hey, no worries, that's great. What differentiates us is nobody's got the unpowered space lines like we have. Nobody has the ability through partnerships to well, let's say that they won't eventually have that. But right now we've got a five to seven year head start in the entire marketplace, and it's a defensible position. Because if you're, let's just say you're RBC Signals and you launch an optical head, kick ass, great job, congratulations again, more validation for us. But what that optical head can't do is it can't perform like a, like a relay, like a relay set like can for us. And we're the exclusive hardware provider for that network, so they can't compete with us in a relay environment. So now they're now they're they're, they're cut down to 64 minutes a day and passive. 
so it's great that they're developing these technologies because it helps to validate us. Um, but when it comes to competition, uh, you know, we're not getting into spectrum. You know, I'm kind of glad they're getting into optical. Wish they wouldn't. You know, it'd be nice to have no competition. But at the same time, listen, space is a pretty big place. And between 1,800 satellites currently and 20 plus thousand that are getting launched over the next three to five years, uh, I really, I'll be honest with you, I wanted to validate your question, but I really don't think about it. No, yeah, I really don't. It, it's not because it's a cocky thing, it's just if I spend all my time thinking about what the competition is doing, I'm going to lose track of what I need to do. But it's a great question, and, and you're right, there is validation in that. I was going to say, Mark, that there's so much demand for what you're being able to provide. There's, there's plenty of room for everybody at the moment. Yeah, there, there really is. There really is. Um, thank you. So I was just going to ask, do you have any aspirations for, I guess, creating an internet or something that is that you can use at, you know, on Earth, or is it a viable market to think of it in that way? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, wow. Well, um, I'll, I'll be really brief on this because I have a long time to answer that. Um, to answer your question, yes, I do. Um, you know, I, uh, I wrote a business plan for on off block, and it was a really lengthy business plan. The bridge was 250 pages. This is a freaking novel. <laughs> and it's funny because in that business plan, um, I, I talked about uh, launching a decentralized, uh, a decentralized uh, space based internet system. Um, so think about like AWS and Facebook and, and basically the internet, um, all decentralized and hosted and managed in space. Uh, laser beams are based on physics are pretty much unhackable. So uh, you know, coupling that with quantum communication um, and a couple other tips and different types of encryption, um, we could actually launch a you know, call it Internet 2.0. I call it something different. I'm not really ready to talk about what I call it, but. To answer your question, yeah, I think there's a um, there's a there's a, a future market for a, a non-corporate owned internet. Uh, right now, Google and Apple, Microsoft, and a couple other very small entities uh, control the entire market, and they have control all of our data too. And I think that you know data needs to be owned by us. We're the ones creating it. You know, data footprint should be yours, but it should be nobody else's, unless you want to monetize it and rent it for sale to a company. Google or somebody else. Those are dangerous conversations um, because you know revealing too much and really put you in an ugly trick bag or a pretty pickle with companies like that. But yeah, to answer your question. Yeah, and we've got some thought processes on that. Uh, we're working with a couple companies right now in developing a, um, a research partnership to launch um, a couple uh, multi terabit on uh, on orbit storage facilities. Um, Actually, talking with Barbara Planet and a couple other of his projects as well. So, yeah, there's a lot of that uh, that's kind of quietly happening in the background. Um, and I think that that really is, um, that will be what opens the future of, of, of you know, the space economy, is that scalability and that you know, in space storage. Answer your question? Yeah. What about dual use? Have you thought about using it as a laser imager for like a green cloud? Satellite you got a, you got a simulator on there, obviously. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought about it. Um, let's say we won't. Um, you know, good question. Uh, I don't know the answer. Uh, you know, it's uh, there's just there's so many applications. Yeah, there's just so many applications, and and and, and hopefully through recruiting we can. You know, I want to bring back kind of the old 80-20 thing that people used to do which is, you know, do your job 80% of the time, 20% come up with a really kick-ass idea, but I want to put a little bit of a cherry on that. I want to allow the employees to own part of the IP so they can get really wealthy off of their ideas. We actually want to have the kids, the employees' kids there, full our engineers. Yeah. For that exact reason. Yeah, I mean, you know, work, work, work quality, work life quality, work life balance. I mean, to me, it doesn't mean anything because I love what I do. And I've fallen in love with what we do. It's just, I'm working so it's different for me, right? But it needs to, you know, everybody needs to have something like that. I hope we can do that, but I answered the other question, sorry. Are you a private company or are you a public company? And if you do, 
I can see you know, technology and other companies and other industries probably be very interested, especially when we talk about the internet. I can see other uh, local companies want to come and try to make a nation company and how to buy it. Yeah. Um, what was the first part of your Oh, oh, yeah, private right. company. Sorry, like, I, love the, I love the second part of it. Uh, we're a private company, uh, Delaware C Corp. We started as an LLC. And we had our first investor meeting and we learned really quick that was not a good idea. So, yeah, switch from an LLC to a C Corp. Um, as far as like IPO and stuff like that, you know, I, I think the market will tell us, Mark will tell us what we should do. Um, I have some thoughts on that, but, you know, they're just, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I don't know, what are you going to wear to work tomorrow? Well, and it's not tomorrow yet. Yeah. I wear the exact same outfit every day, actually. So I've got like 40 of these and a bunch of pairs of jeans, and they literally look like this every single day. Because I just stop caring about my work. work. <laughs> Sorry, does that answer your question, then? <laughs> oh, just a quick question on the partnerships and alliances you put together. Like, I mean, was it, was it your IP, your like enthusiasm? I mean, like, what made people get on board with you before, you know, you guys maybe had it all done. I just, I love selling. It's, I mean, I, you know, you can take the CEO role away and just call me a sales guy. Uh, I love people. Um, I mean, I, I probably a lot of the enthusiasm. The IP is cool, but you know, the IP is going to be, you know, obsolete in four or five years. So, you know, I mean, there's, there, right now, every idea that you guys and gals in this, in this, in this entire building, not just this room, but uh, any idea we're thinking of, there's two 15, 16 year old kids sitting in the garage in Edward Lee, USA, getting ready to launch a business that's going to change the world. And it's based upon an idea you're thinking about. It's true. Google's a prime example. So we're, you know, half the things that we're surrounded by you know, microphones, you know, lights, chairs. There's a market got hoarded on every single thing that we interact with every day at some point in history. So, yeah, I, I think it's, it's with enthusiasm probably more than anything. Um, sometimes you have to manufacture that enthusiasm because you don't always feel like this. You know, that's I think where the rubber meets the road. You know, Are you, can you do it on demand? Is it, or is, is it just only when you feel like it? Does that answer your question? Cool, anything else? Thanks, appreciate it. Thanks again, Mark. Let's, let's have a big hand for Mark. We really, really appreciate the story, and these are the kinds of successes that we want to see coming out of New Space Chicago. So uh, next month, we are not going to have uh, an event. Uh, it turns out the second Thursday is Valentine's Day, and we'll probably want to do something else on that day. Uh, so our next event is going to be March 14th. Uh, and we will hear from Sean Casey of Atlas Space Operations, uh, who Mark, Mark mentioned. So uh, thank you for coming out, and uh, please, you're welcome to, to hang out for a bit and continue the conversation. Thanks again.